Welcome to Men Unplugged with your host, Jeff Jarena. Get ready to plug in and recharge your life as Jeff visits with influential Christian leaders, helping you experience the life you were truly meant to live. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jeff here and welcome to the Men Unplugged show where we help men and their families strengthen their faith and recharge their life. And on today's episode, I'm going to be talking with speaker, strategist, and third-generation business owner, Bill Yo. He's also the author of the book, Unvarnished Faith, Learning to Love with a Servant's Heart. And that's what we're going to be discussing today, how we as the body of Christ can love with a servant's heart. Now, before we do that, I want to share a resource with you. It's our Men Unplug Courses page. And on that page, you'll find self-paced courses and coaching that will help you grow spiritually draw closer to the Lord, live your God-given purpose, enhance your leadership skills, and reach others for Jesus. To find out more and start one of those courses today, visit menunplugged.net forward slash courses. That's C-O-U-R-S-E-S. All right, let's meet today's featured guest, Bill Yo. Bill, welcome to the show, brother. Hi, Jeff. It's really my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I'm super excited. And actually, just before we started recording here, you and I were talking here for about 10, 15 minutes, and you have an interesting story. You've done a lot of great things. And before we really get into the conversation, take a minute to say, hey, again, to the Men Unplugged community and tell them something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Something interesting about myself that most people don't know. So I, I, I grew up in a family business, and it's a pretty large family business. Um, so we have 45,000 employees, and I'm still a, one of the third generation owners. But uh, in addition to that, my wife and I also own a small seasonal business with, with 10 seasonal workers, and that's actually a miniature golf course. So uh, I'm both the owner and the maintenance manager of a miniature golf course here on the coast in New Jersey. So not a lot of people uh, know that, and not a lot of people own miniature golf courses. So... <laughs> That's great. And so, you know, 45,000 employees, that is a very, very large company. And so that would, that tells me that you guys are doing something well. And so the Lord is blessing you with that. And so, hey, let's talk about the, that miniature golf course, because you shared here that you and your wife, when you guys were thinking about this thing, you kind of lost a bet on that deal. <laughs> yes, yes. No, it, uh, you know, I, we, we, we're celebrating 26 years of marriage in a couple of weeks. And, and so what I tell people is, the course came for sale. Kelly wanted to buy it. I didn't want to buy it. So we compromised and we bought it. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and hey, for any guy that's listening right now that's married, that's pretty much how it works, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. So, uh, but no, it's, it's, it, it brings joy to the community. Uh, it's a chance for us to, to work together. And, and actually, by the way, our children have all, have all worked at the business at various times. And in many ways, they've learned more about business working at this small seasonal business than somehow being in the, in the orbit of, you know, our, our large family business. So. So with that, we're going to jump right into the conversation where we're going to be talking about this idea of learning to love with a servant's heart. And when I say that, we know that as believers, but let's be honest, it's tough to do that. Okay. I, you know, all the time. And so that's actually the subtitle of your new book, Unvarnished faith. And so right off the bat, Bill, I want to ask you about that title, because to me, it seems because I looked at the prologue and introduction, I didn't read every chapter, but it seems to me that ha that has a personal meaning to you. Yeah, no, thanks for asking, Jeff. And it, and it really does. And both the title and the subtitle almost to the word have a lot of meaning. So uh, first, the title Unvarnished Faith, uh, it's a it's a term that I coined um, and it, it, it came out of a uh, mission trip that I took to Nicaragua, the first of my overseas mission trips I did a few years ago. And I did it with a ministry that my brother Jeff and his wife Suzanne had launched called Servants with the Heart. And that's where the subtitle comes in. But on this, on this trip to Nicaragua, I was really struck by how vastly different in every way imaginable life was for people there than what my life is, is like living outside Philadelphia here in the United States. And and just the, the contrast in every way you could think. But we were on a Christian mission and it was a Christian ministry and a lot of interaction with people were not just bringing food, but also bringing the word. And what I really found was through our common faith, how much we had in common. 
And, and that's where I came to this idea of if you unvarnish the faith, if you strip away, whether it's the geographic or socioeconomic or denominational doctrinal divides, you know, all the things that, that can get one thing or the other, you know, we really are all called to love God. We're called to love neighbors ourselves. We're called to discern our talents and gifts and deploy them to help the less fortunate. You know, these are all universal tenets. And even outside of the Christian faith tradition, other faith traditions have similar things where ultimately you're called to focus on love and on relationships and being present to the love and present to the relationships in your lives. That was certainly Jesus Christ's central message for me. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with what faith is without all the things that go on top of it. So that's the unvarnished faith side. The the learning to love with the servant's heart is, that first of all, I'm a, I'm a perpetual student. I abide by the axiom that the truly educated never graduate. Um, I just earned a second master's degree during the pandemic in ministry and theology. Um, but but learning to love with a servant's heart, the more I worked on the manuscript and, and got through the book and did all the different things, it really came back to the name of the ministry that brought me there, Servants with the Heart. And, and if you can serve others and serve through your heart, and, and that's going to feed your mind, that's going to feed your arms and legs, it's going to feed your voice. But learning to love with a servant's heart, which is, again, what, what Christ taught us, is in my mind, no better way to execute the mission we're called to execute during our earthly pilgrimage. I really like that title, Unvarnished Faith, because really, just like you said at the end of the day, as believers in Christ, we're all the same. You know, it, it, it's to me, I see it as the enemy wants us to be talking about all these other little theological, doctrinal things that a lot of times we as men and women we think are a bigger issue where God says that's not the main focus. It's to to know him, to worship him, and to love others and to make him known. That's that's really those three things. If we can focus on that, it makes everything a lot easier. But Bill, here here's the elephant in the room, right? Before we keep going here, I, I want I want to get your comment on this. It sounds great. It's great to talk about it, but how do you implement that on a daily basis or kind of shift your heart, your spirit towards that. Do you kind of talk about that in the book? I do. And and I talk about that in a lot of the speaking events I'm doing around uh, the book as well. And even in, I'm in three different small groups and I facilitate two of them. I talk about it there. Um, You know, a few of them are ecumenical that on the one hand, you know, I, I, I'm a, I was a lifelong Protestant in, in a mainline uh, in a tradition, in the Episcopal tradition. I actually conter- converted to Roman Catholicism about four or five years ago, but I just published a book on an evangelical mission trip. So I kind of run the gamut within the Christian faith. But My brain's so like I, tripping I, out right now. What? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so I like to consider myself equal parts an uppercase C Roman Catholic and a lowercase C universal Catholic. Okay. Because obviously Catholic and lowercase four means universal Christian. And but on the one hand, so whatever if somebody affiliates with a particular denomination or doctrine, or even if somebody's non-denominational, that in itself is an ethos. That to me, I see that's a person's way to feel close, better connected to God, better connected to the divine, have a better relationship with Christ, have at it, good for you. That's awesome. But where we get into trouble is where we start to think that one connection or avenue to God is more important or more relevant or more uh, uh, credible than another is. And, and that's something where, you know, particularly in my in my Catholic tradition and some of my Roman Catholic circles, where I find myself often, you know, just asking questions of people and just maybe pushing back ways. And, and again, and, and, and a, from a place of love and a place of presence and relationship, but just asking people to think about you know, a particular point of view. And is that really the way Jesus wants us to see things? We all know most of Jesus's ministry, the vast majority took place in in places other than a house of worship. Sure, he turned the tables over at the temple. He preached in a synagogue a few times, but the vast majority of what he did was out with the people, dealing in the vernacular, in secular environments, and, and just being in relationship and being present to people. And that has nothing to do with transubstantiation or female ordination or pap or, or clerical celibacy or any of those kind of things or, or tradition versus scripture that is all to me not even second second backseat that's like back of the bus type stuff compared to just being present to others expressing kindness compassion bringing that heart of Jesus bringing the servant's heart to anybody you interact with yeah that's a good point there and I, I would just sum that up with two words everyday life 
That's where Jesus was doing his mission, everyday life. And, and really, that's what we do as well. If you think about it, most of what you do, most of your relationships, most of your communication, your, your opportunities to share Jesus with others is in everyday life, whatever that is. I actually just did an um, episode on this uh, several weeks ago, and I called it the ultimate identity test for Christians. My thought is, when somebody asks us, well, how do you base your identity? I think it should just be this. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, saved by grace. That's it. It's that simple. And if we can do that, then you know what? Then we start seeing all these other little things, not that big of a deal, right? Because we know our identity is in Jesus. All right, that's my two cents. We're going to keep going here. (laughs) Sounds good. You have a chapter in the book called God Winks. So what do you mean by God winks. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll first say that it, it's not my term. I'm not right now recalling the, the person who coined the term, but uh, one of my one of my fellow brothers in Christ brought the term to me a number of years ago. So, you know, I've come to believe over my faith journey that there are no coincidences in life, that, that you know, th- things happen for a reason, that, that you know, I, I am open to the revelation of God through what happens to me to discern what that impact is. And it may not be a mountaintop moment. It may be something small. It may be get the vanilla, not the chocolate. Like, let's not make a big deal out of everything. But when I run into people or certain things happen or certain doors open or windows close or whatever, um, but sometimes there are these little kind of things that that might be a God wink. So, um, you know, a, a recent example was I was uh, walking on the beach, actually not recent, but it comes to mind. I was walking on the beach maybe a year or so ago with my wife and it was in the off season. And um, we had just had this really lovely exchange about something just in our relationship. And it wasn't like a relationship walk, but just we had this very warm thing like, oh, I really like when you do that. Well, that's great. You know, I do, too. And I looked down and I saw an, a, a, uh, an unblemished conch shell looking back up at me. Mm. That's a God wink. That to yeah. me is like we just had this, you know, two, 20 word exchange of love and relationship. And then this beautiful uh manifestation of nature and this reward shows up. So little things like that sometimes just show up as God winks. And, and I find the more we talk about them and the more we look for them, the more they show up. Again, you're not over assigning meanings to, like I said, vanilla versus chocolate, but you know, you're, you're kind to somebody in the store and then your favorite song comes on the radio. Who knows? Yeah. That, that's a good point. It's almost like, well, in that moment, it was like that movie Moana, the conch show came right up there, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's mm-hmm. cool. So I want to go back to this thing that you said early on in the show, and then I'm going to ask you a couple more questions about the book, but you talked about you were on this mission trip and you're in, you know, in Nicaragua. Now, was that the same mission trip that where you were directed or you were led to a garbage dump and that's where you saw people living? It was that the same one. And if it was, can you talk a little bit more about that and really what that did while you were there in your heart at that time. Yeah, no, and I, and thanks for asking that because it really was uh, this, this this that first mission trip was a very pivotal moment in my life, and our time in this garbage dump was was the most you know pivotal moment of that trip. Um, so it's our first day in country, first full day. We we go to this garbage dump. We pull in. There's literally it, it's acres and acres of just a, a mountain of trash, and people live there. And, and there's little fires burning all over the place. And, and it's, it's just so uh, tough to just comprehend. You know, it's just, it's out of anything I could possibly imagine. So you have people living here. Uh, some are shoeless. You have j- families there. You use stories of gangrene. And of course, there's no services. There's no markets. There's no health care. There's no education. So our ministry is a very important thing that we bring food to these people. And we're a major way that they acquire their sustenance. And but these are all, you know, Christians and believers in Christ. And so that's a bit of the entree, if you will, you know, with, with these missions, the part of the art is knowing when you lead with the food and when you lead with the word. Well, with right. these folks, it's a little bit of both. But we had the chance to meet this woman named Maria. And Maria was a second of three generations living uh, in this trash dump. So and sad. So we, we, saw, we saw her kids. We saw her father. And uh, the head of our in-country ministry that, that Servants with the Heart works with interviewed her. And translate it for us, you know, and, and I just, again, spending a couple hours on site, so just in utter shock of everything going on. And, and it's my opening vignette of the book because it was that meaningful. Um, he asked her, you know, how do you feel living here? 
And how do you feel about all of this? And literally there's trash burning. I'm standing on medical waste. And it's just, it's incredible. And we're all thinking, oh, she's going to be, be just, you know, hopeless, upset, angry, sad, whatever. She said with a, you know, a very strong voice, yo estoy contenta. I am happy. And you could have knocked all 20 of us over, 15 of us with a feather, having heard, I am happy. Mm. So we, we, we try and sort of collect ourselves and, and, and the, the leader asked the, the appropriate follow up. Wait, happy. Can you please expand on that a little? And she said, well, I'm happy because this morning I woke up. I did not know how I was going to feed my children. I prayed to God and God sent you with food. Wow. So I'm happy. No, that, that was a I God wink it, right there. That was a no, God wink. And not in, in nutshells, but unvarnished faith is, you know, there's no judginess. There's no prayers. There's no, um, you know, preaching, there's no rosary. It was just, God, my kids are hungry. Please answer my prayer. And the prayer was answered. And, um, you know, it really was just, and then the beauty that the, the, the uh, sort of the uh, pro or post log or the postmark of this is that night uh, we were doing a little debrief and we were chaperoning high schoolers. And so, you know, what happened today? what do you think about it? And so one of the guys says, um, well, gosh, I can't believe that woman said she's happy. And he, and he follows up and says, can you, and she's happy with having like literally nothing. Can you imagine how she feel if she had everything we had? And without missing a beat, another one of the high schoolers goes, oh, she wouldn't be happy. So, and we thought, okay, mission accomplished. If the kids see that, if they see what, what again, true joy is, and in this case, we're talking about, I'd say joy over happiness, because it's an internally generated divine experience. You know, true joy is not something that material possessions get you. And, and, and certainly I would say they... They, in some ways, they're called material trappings for a reason. They make it, in some ways, much harder to access true joy. And M Maria, in that moment, was accessing true joy. That is a great story, Bill. And, and you, as you were sharing that, I, I'm trying to picture myself there, it, you know, as you in that moment. And number one, I just got to be thinking the scene would have been so powerful. I'm sure that because I've heard somebody else that has gone on a mission trip or something like that. And they said, just the smell is just overpowering. And, and you're looking at it and you're, and you're, you have these thoughts like, how am I going to help these people? I mean, did you feel powerless in that you moment? Know, it, it, I, fe I, I don't know if I felt powerless. I felt maybe, yeah, hopeless, maybe um, like, and helpless, like that. I, what, what could I possibly do? But, the, the folks in Servants with the Heart, my brother and, and some of his sort of fellow leaders and, and my sister-in-law, they do this really great thing where, you know, a lot of mission work are, you know, to go down and build a, you know, build a well or build a schoolhouse or, or work on those kinds of things. And there's all sorts of debates about is that money best spent that way or investing it in a country. With Servants with the Heart missions are about building relationship. And they're about being in relationship with others and being in relationship through the common bond of our, of our Christianity and our commitment to Jesus. and what we learned very quickly was, you know, yes, we're going to give these people food and they won't be hungry for a day, but tomorrow they'll be hungry. But if we can be in relationship with them, even if just through a warm smile or a brief hug or a, or a you know, roughly the, the, the hair of, of one of the youngsters, you know, or, or throwing a Frisbee, as I had a chance to do with one young man one of those days, that, that, that snapshot of relationship, that, that brief moment of connection, that, that, could buoy somebody and sustain somebody far longer than the physical nourishment of, of a meal might. And that to me, once that coin dropped for me or that domino fell for me, I realized like, ah, okay, I got it now. This is about, it's about being uncomfortable because I'm interacting with people that I don't know and have nothing in common with, except for the most com important thing, our, our relationship with Christ. But once I got through that and realized like, there are so many ways that we can connect that have nothing to do with language, that have nothing to do with geographic similarity, educational similarity, racial similarity. We can connect through being in relationship with each other, which is, again, what we're called to do. I really appreciate that that perspective because I can see it as those individuals in that situation can see that they're not only just significant in God's eyes, but significant in somebody else's eyes outside of that situation. So that that's... That's a really great way of looking at that. So we're going to about to wrap this thing up here, but I want you to share here, Bill, six of the key values or tenets that you talk about in your book, Unvarnished Faith. And then if you could, and along the same, you know, maybe the same response there, what are one or two 
that most resonate with you? Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. So, so as I, you know, this book on varnished faith, it's it's ultimately about love and relationship. But the more I worked on the book, the more I thought about the trip, these six tenets sort of undergirded what it takes to get to love and relationship. And and the book's written in six parts, which is the six days of the trip. They track these six. We have study guides in the back for small groups and and uh, and book clubs and such. So I let off with character and just the whole idea of sort of foundationally just being a good person, working hard, having integrity, having accountability. That feeds into dignity. You know, to me, one of the central messages of the gospel is that everybody has the inherent right to dignity. Everyone is, is created in God's image. Everyone has the right to dignity, regardless of any dimension of difference you would want to or identity you would want to talk about. So I talk about dignity and gender and different things in there. And that feeds into talking about talents and the idea of talents and gifts, how God created each one of us with you with a unique basket of talents and gifts. And as I said earlier, we're called to deploy those to help the less fortunate. Uh, following on that is serenity. And I'll come back to serenity in a minute, but that really stems from the serenity prayer of what we can and can't control. And, and, and in my case, being able to be serene with what I can't control and being present in the moment. Uh, the next one I talk about is one that I don't think our society talks about nearly enough is failure. You know, I come from a, a privileged background socioeconomically, good education, physical health, uh, marriage, you know, all those kinds of things. You know, failure is something that we kind of like explain away or avoid or, or other kinds of things. But it's really important, I think, for people to embrace failure, to recognize that's where real growth happens. By the way, in your trauma and your struggles, that's where God tends to show up more. And then and then I end with gratitude and, and I end with gratitude and per, uh, intentionally. Um, because that to me sums up everything. So you asked for one or two that I'm really focused on. Well, one of them is certainly gratitude. And, and you know, gratitude is one of those things that the more you practice it, the more it shows up. And the more gratitude you put out there, both internally, there's a whole school of study on neuroplasticity and those kind of things. The more you practice a grateful way of being and of actually having grateful comments come out of your mouth, the more your mind is literally going to wire around issues of gratitude as opposed to issues of negativity or fear or, or doubt. Um, and it's amazing the way when I practice that more, it really does come back to roost. Um, but the other one that that from a personal growth perspective has been this whole idea about serenity and about being comfortable in my own skin, about being present in the moment, not letting you know the meeting that just happened or the trip that's coming up or get in the way of my conversation or the person or the event right in front of me at the time. And, and I've really experienced a lot of growth in that. It's, it's helped with some anger issues I'd had. It's helped with some different sort of addictive personality things that have, that have kind of riddled me through my life. And, but it's one that's certainly a journey I continue to be on with serenity. So, so again, guys, the six tenants there that he talks about are character, dignity, talents, serenity, failure, and gratitude. And I think that's a great list there. Um, you know, you talked about serenity. Nowadays, we we have a opportunity to practice this almost every second, right? There's mm -hmm. just so many distractions. I mean, we're, yeah. and there's so many yeah. things that we have no control over. And at the end of the day, we have to realize that God is in control, not us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that can be difficult because I know for myself, I seem to have this false illusion of control that I have more control over things than I really don't at all. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I would say I get slapped in the face a lot when I realize that, right? <laughs> for myself. Right. 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 But um, so as we close this down, guys, I just want to encourage you to, again, just check out this episode here, share it to others. Check out more about Bill. And with that, Bill, I'm going to give you a chance here to just give the listeners one parting tip of wisdom, one last tip here, and tell them where they can find out more about you and where they can get a copy of Unvarnished Faith. Sure. No, and, and the, the tip will be in this idea of talents and talents and gifts and discerning what we're uniquely good at and how to deploy that. So the word ministry gets really scary for people, you know, and, 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 but we all, we all have the ability to minister, not from a pulpit or from a, a pew or whatever, but if we really discern what it is we're called to do and how we're called to be with other people, that's our ministry. So I'll hear a lot of people say, well, I've got my job and my family and everything else. And I do a soup kitchen once a quarter and I do deliver turkeys at Thanksgiving. I need to do more of that. My response is always, well, well, yes, but, and if you could think about what you do with that 80, 90% of your time, or even recast it or reinterpret it, even just for yourself, 
about you discerning and deploying your talents and gifts to help other people, to help the world, then you're in ministry. Then you're answering the call with, with the majority of your time, not just what you think you're doing, you know, once a quarter and, and, and over Thanksgiving. So that, that would definitely be my parting thing for people is, is you may be closer to, you know, being the arms and legs than you think you are. If you just think about how, what you do is deploying your talents and gifts. Um, thanks for that. Yeah. So unvarnishedfaith.com is my website and that has information about me. It has information on the book. It has links directly to buy the book. Uh, I've got another book that I put out a few years ago. I've got some poetry, got some other things in there, but, um, and, and also if you'd be interested in, in talking with me, you can get in touch with me from there. So unvarnishedfaith.com and I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram as well. You can find me author Bill Yo in those places and really grateful for the time. Bill, thanks again. And guys, that's unvarnishedfaith.com. And again, if you don't get that right now, come back to the episode, play it again, take some notes. Again, it's unvarnishedfaith.com. Bill, thanks so much. I, I really do appreciate your time today. Thanks a lot, Jeff. It was my pleasure. Well, that wraps up today's episode. And I want to say thanks again to Bill Yo for being a guest on the show. And to you, the Mental Pug Faithful, for taking the time out of your schedule to be a part of this conversation, to hopefully gain some wisdom and some extra firepower to live as a true warrior of Jesus Christ. And with that, I want to encourage you to visit the Mental Plug Courses page at mentalplug.net forward slash courses and enroll in one of those self-paced, easy-to-follow trainings that you can access at your own convenience anytime you like so that you can grow spiritually, draw closer to the Lord, live your God-given purpose, enhance your leadership skills, and or reach others for Jesus. Thanks again. God bless.